Hello there and welcome to my vlog of this, the second week of January 2022. And today's episode is going to be a continuation of something that I did a couple of weeks ago when I talked about how to kind of battalion build in Battletech. And I kind of had uh, this spreadsheet uh, on the screen then. But things have kind of progressed quite a bit. Um, since I did that video, I've really kind of fleshed this out now. Um, and what I really wanted to discuss today was how to kind of build and develop a mercenary unit within the like Battletech universe and tie that in with like the narrative and however you want to have your Battletech experience, whether that's through things like roleplay or whether it's through tabletop or even things like writing, right? Which I like to do. I like, I'm do like to do creative writing so I will quite happily sit and write like scenarios that I'll kind of then like enact on uh, or reenact sorry on tabletop but many different things that that you can do in that respect and it's the primary reason we're really why our hobby uh, the wider hobby is the premier of all hobbies for the simple reason that um, there are so many different creative outlets it's not like, uh, say, computer games, where unless you're doing something quite technical in a computer game, like you decide you want to uh, do mods for games, which is obviously creative. You might have to do like artwork or design, things like that. Generally, if you're playing a computer game, you are just consuming the game and playing through the mechanics of that game on a set path. It's why I would guess that uh, video games are so popular because they're quite easy and quite easy to fall into and this is meant there's no disrespect to video games i play video games myself but i think if you're talking about a, a hobby that gives you like a multi-faceted experience that touches on creativity and design and um, things that give you like soft skills in life right like if you are playing as a dungeon master you kind of need to know how to do public speaking and logistics and organisation, things like that. And they are obviously super helpful. You ain't going to necessarily get those skills playing Doom, right? Like, or even more sophisticated um, computer games um, because it's kind of set out on a path for you that you follow as opposed to you having to use your imagination. And what I really want to discuss today is how to get into that mindset and how mercenary units are really kind of the premier way in Battletech to experience it. And in order to talk about this fully, I, I kind of need to give a little bit of a synopsis of a book that I picked up last year, which is uh, this. This is the 1987 Mercenary Handbook. Uh, great read. It was in a complete state when I found it, so I've had to kind of rebind all the um, all the kind of um, spine of the book, that's it. Um, and like like tape it up because it was in a complete like car crash when I found it. Luckily though, all the artwork and the, the actual paper survived. So it just needed some uh, TLC. This book though is great. Now, before I start this, I kind of need to say where I come from in terms of my like Battletech playing or experience, whatever you want to say. I don't do role play. I've never ever played a role play game in my life. Um, it's just it doesn't interest me. I can see why it would be very popular, because it for the reasons I just cited, it's creative and it's interesting. And you know, especially if you kind of are doing the DMing and you are good at that side of it, I can imagine it's like very very fulfilling. But for me personally, I my creative outlets are in actually the writing, the pen in the like terrain creation. Um, and in things like this Excel sheet, sadly and weirdly enough, which is basically like force building. And what I wanted to discuss today is how you can kind of bring all those like, or how, well, how I bring those like components together and how they interweave through building a mercenary unit. You will have your own path as well. And that's kind of what this video is. Like, how do you kind of make it multifaceted and then tie it all together to get the the richest experience so for you for instance you might really just like the roleplay aspect to it you might just love the battletech lore and universe you might not do the tabletop thing so you might think to yourself well i'm going to put books like this up and look at the front end which tells me all the kind of rules and ideas to give dm um to, to give the dm and you can tie that together with the other like role-playing battletech books 
And that will be my creative outlook. And my kind of writing creativity is then done in creating the actual like narratives and scenarios and having uh, people who are coming along and playing that like role play game. And then they are maybe the mercenary unit or the, I don't know, like the house guard of one of the great inner sphere powers or something like that. And you then take them on that journey. For me, though, like I said, for me, it's contained within list building, model painting, um, terrain creation to an extent, but that's kind of here and there. And if you're playing on tabletop, you have to do something like that, really. Um, and how all the, I'm sorry, creative writing as well, and how those kind of factors all come in to give me a very, very broad um, hobby, really. And again, find what works for you and or what you are like interested in in terms of whether it's like battle tech and this obviously relates to other hobbies as well but in this particular video i'm going to talk specifically about like narratives on the like from a mercenary unit standpoint and how they go through a certain time period and how that will kind of attach itself and work within every single narrative point that you are interested in for instance like you know you put your mercenary unit at a time and space and then they are forced to deal with a problem that you can like reenact on tabletop or do creative writing for or whatever else. Mercenary units are easily the best way to do that for the simple reason that they're so um, like adaptable to situations because as a mercenary unit, you don't have the like the consequences of like say for instance, if you played um, Russell Hard Republic and the Russell Hard Republic basically go out of existence Kind of, they get swallowed up by um, by the Ghost Bear uh, Dominion eventually. But if when the Wrath of the Republic is gone, basically it's like Comstar that keep it um, like going by putting like a like the Com Guard there. So you know this is obviously like post Tukid in thirty fifty two. But it's going to be difficult for you if you're kind of beyond that period and you're playing like a Rasselhag um, like outfit there's not much they can do really like they're not that interweaved in the the major storylines because they've basically gone extinct because of the the clan invasion with a mercenary unit though you can kind of zip around wherever the hell you want and you can say okay well in this era i like this thing and then i can go to the, in this era they can basically jump over to this system and do a hundred different things across that time span now in order to do this, I, I have to kind of set some parameters. And I always do love a parameter because if you give yourself like a defined, codified parameter to work within, you give yourself like universe rules. And that is very, very helpful. That means that you can't ever, <clears throat> excuse me, you can't ever do anything silly. So you can't say, okay, I'm going to like cross over with the Star Wars universe or something like that. Obviously, you can do that. It's your game. Do what the hell you want. But to do something like that would obviously be chaotic and very subjective to you. If you give yourself parameters early on, a good one is a time period. And if you've watched my previous videos, you know that I am a stickler for uh, 3025 to 3067. I don't want to really to do anything within Battletech that's outside of that core period for me. So my mercenary unit kind of exists from that you know, in that like um, like mini epoch, which kind of goes from the end of the Succession Wars to the, the Fedcom Civil War. And that's like a pretty hard rule. Like I would never run a tabletop scenario in um, 3068 or 3069 because that's kind of when the um, Word of Blake kicks off. Likewise, I'm not particularly interested in playing like a, a second Succession War scenario because obviously all my characters from the Dusk Haunters aren't born then. Um, that's not to say you don't do some random stuff like it, you I do have a lot of mechs so I could run a tabletop game of like you know Lyran Commonwealth versus Draconis Combine in I don't know, 28 60, 64 or something you know whatever you you can do lots of like interesting things with that but I think as an actual for want of a better term a cornerstone of my experience I really do like to sit in between those like classic eras of 3025 to 3067 and therefore that's makes sense there and that that's where the dust corners gravitate and I, I touched on a lot of what I'm going to discuss today um, in the actual like battalion building episode but I'm going to flesh it out a bit and try to give you some ideas on if you are interested in, in building a mercenary unit how best to do it and where to kind of find the the influence or the like the impetus to go and do it and the, the book here is a really really like great starting point 
I'm sure they they may have made like reissues. Uh, this is obviously a um, a pre clan invasion book, so it's very focused towards the inner sphere. It, it, there are like a lot of hints on the clan invasion. I, I'm convinced that they knew uh, about the clan invasion and where the direction they wanted to take the actual like uh, story arcs or or narrative, if you want to call it. I think they knew that right at the beginning, but they didn't kind of release the clan invasion as a thing until the late eighties, early nineties. So this is before that time period. However, you do see a lot of reference to things like the Wolf Dragoons, who it turns out are a, a clan mercenary unit when we kind of learn the truth about them. But this book in particular, the, the great thing that it does, the really, really useful thing, is that it documents, at the back end of the book, it documents three very, very... Well, it two... One incredibly famous mercenary unit, one relatively famous unit, and one unit that are completely useless. And that's really good, because then you get the full spectrum. So if you so chose to do so, you can run a mercenary unit that is three regiments. If you want to reflect that on tabletop, you're going to have to learn how to play Alpha Strike, and you're going to probably need a lot of money to buy a lot of mechs, because three regiments is a ton of plastic or metal and yeah prepare yourself for that so if you wanted to kind of um do something crazy like if you wanted uh to do uh, an entire wolf dragoon regiment or something like that just be aware that's going to be a hell of a lot of work uh, and expense in this book though what they do is those those kind of three levels that they give you are super useful because it really documents just like the structures of how a mercenary unit would work and the first um, like mercenary unit that they deal with is the Iridani Light Horse. Um, Iridani Light Horse, which everyone knows in Battletech, they are the lovely like yellow and black um, sigil there of the, the stallion. And Iridani Light Horse are one of the most important like factions, mercenary units in Battletech. They actually stay behind during the um, SLDF Exodus. So become, as you expect, very, very powerful um, after uh, Kerensky leaves because they've got like all the SLDF technology and are still very like prominent and are like really battle hardened. And in Battletech, their kind of story goes on for a long, long time. And in this book, um, it documents them from uh, from the standpoint of three regiments. And it's huge. I mean, I can't really do this justice by showing you the pictures, but you can see that's kind of their chart. Try and get the glare off that. There we go. Uh, that's the like the three regimental chart that they use. Um, so, for instance, there in the middle is the twenty first striker regiment. Uh, a regiment is um, comprised usually of between three and five battalions. Uh, a battalion is comprised of three companies, a company is comprised of three lances, and a lance is comprised of four battle mechs. So if you go back and do all the math down that like tree, a regiment is really big. And it's not just the like 100 and plus mechs that are on the books. Each one of those battalions will have things like uh, tanks and aerotech and you know support, mech techs, doctors, cleaning staff, nurses uh you name it they'll have it cooks chefs yeah they, they effectively like the iridani light horse are effectively like a nation in space you know if you want to put it that way and three regiments of that not to mention i mean it will be like an absolute flotilla like if you kind of keep in mind that um like a regular um union dropship in battletech will house like 12 mechs so how and then there's there's obviously like the bigger drop ships and then you've got like right down to leopards which is which just hold which house four uh, battle mechs, but think how much of an armada you would need and how much how many like logisticians and you know like you you know you're flying to a planet and everyone needs feeding so you're gonna have to go and buy like all the food stores and it obviously can spiral out of control, uh, so you'd need people who know what they were doing basically to make that work. And this book is a, like a role play book, gives you some really good information on how to manage that. So if you were if you were trying to kind of manage something like a, a unit as big as the uh, like the Iridani Light Horse, you would have to basically crack the calculator out and start doing a lot of math in terms of like, you know, what jobs they were doing, how much they were getting paid. Um, it would probably become incredibly complex very quickly, but some people would love that. Me personally, like, you know, the Iridani Light Horse are, in effect, like, the big prog rock band, right, in Battletech, like, some like, Queen, 
or ELO or status quo or someone like that. Like, you know, they, they fill the stadiums and everyone like rocks out to them. Um, I personally never would want to do that. Uh, I don't think many people would either. I think you'd have to be a really, really committed person to go and like, you know, to do the, a full like uh, regiment for the Iridani Lighthouse or the Wolf Dragoons. I can well understand. People might do like a company, maybe even a battalion. That's not actually too difficult. But if you want kind of the complete picture, you yeah, that's that is uh, that's an endeavour. Let's just say that. But to each their own. Some people might love the Iridani Lighthouse and everything about them. So if that's the case, then then have fun with uh, a huge mercenary unit. Uh, the next um, mercenary unit that gets documented here is the Waco Rangers. Uh, the Waco Rangers are, uh, they were a mercenary unit um, in like from Capellan um, territory, but they go like freelance and um, they're quite a cool like uh, like outfit. You can see here they've got like the almost like the Texas Star uh, badge going on, which is kind of ironic given that they are Capellans. And it's not like really an aesthetic that you would kind of associate with them. But there's like pictures in here of their like mech warriors and some of them have got like cowboy hats on and stuff like that. So they are pretty cool. Much, much more manageable as well, especially if you wanted to reflect a, a mercenary unit of that side on tabletop. They actually get a, a regiment, just one regiment in this book. Much easier to manage, still big. I mean, I wouldn't do regiment size. I think that is just a bridge too far. But it documents everything here, and this book really does like fill its boots when it comes to detail. So it will go through like every single like company and tell you what mechs they have, and that's just really nice to kind of grasp how big it is. And you can see as well, like you know, if you're kind of interested from a fluff perspective, it tells you like what kind of mechs are associated with what powers or what mercenary factions and, and things like that. So the, and the Waco Rangers, I have a particular a particular affinity for. I know as a kid, I had this book as a kid actually, but it got lost and I had to buy it again last year. Um, but I remember getting this book and I used to really love the Waco Rangers. Like they were the one that I was by far the most interested in uh, because they're kind of competent, but they're small enough to kind of have a personality to them. Like you can see clearly like who is in charge of that. Whereas in the Iridani Lighthouse, it becomes like, they're like the ultramarines of like uh, Battletech. You know, like they, they're so distant and aloof and good at what they do. And yeah, I mean, and, and like I said, that has its place for sure. But when you're talking about a mercenary outfit, I tend to kind of veer more towards the kind of punk side as opposed to the like prog rock side, if you want to use that analogy. Um, and then finally in here, we have the, by far the most interesting mercenary unit. This is Wilson's Hussars, with the worst logo ever conceived, I think, which is like the um, the OK sign with the uh, purple and white there doing this. And the Wilson's Hussars were a real tragic uh, <laughs> like little mercenary outfit. They basically just have a company. Um, it's not necessarily a great company either. They've got um, a heavy, a medium, and a medium, and a light lance, uh, which is kind of standard. I mean, not standard, but when you've just got one company and you're not rocking like any level of like heavy firepower, that's quite problematic. Um, this book goes into great detail to tell you how basically in trouble they are. Like it talks about like the um, the, the mercenary unit have got like issues with drugs <laughs> because I think they're so depressed. Um, and it, yeah, it's kind of like if you want like the absolute like grunge level bottom feeding mercenary unit and you just want to have like say 12 mechs to form a company, it's particularly like visceral in this because they actually give like a loadout of their roster and it actually tells you uh, that some of the mechs are actually destroyed <laughs> so they don't even have a full company, bless them. Um, yeah, you just feel bad for those guys but they are very you know they're kind of at the the fringe um like of, of the battletech universe and if you kind of if you kind of take those three as like standard for how you can kind of fit your like or what you want to do with your mercenary experience i think the best thing then to do is so you say so you've you let's just say it chronologically from how i've been talking now so you've got your time period you want to play in so you might be thinking i want to play um like the word of jihad uh, oh, sorry, Word of Blake uh, into the Jihad. Uh, or I might want to play Second Succession Wars. 
or you might think I want to play a clan invasion and just that, whatever you want to do. So you've got your, your time period. You then need to kind of decide on what kind of mercenary outfit you want. Are they competent? Are they useless? Uh, what, how big are they? Just kind of some broad kind of strokes on what direction you want to take in. And then another really, really important factor is like allegiance and geography. So where are they based? And I'd always kind of do that to whichever area of the Battletech universe appeals to you most. So if you, for instance, love the um, Lyran Commonwealth and have a real animosity to the Draconis Combine, then put them on the, like the border between both states. And that will then draw your mercenaries into a lot of interesting... Um, you know, like narrative story arcs that you can like um, do. Again, I'm going to use it for my experience, so I'll say tabletop, but you can equally do that to for like role play as well. For the dust counters, and if you've watched previous videos, you'll know this. The dust counters are from Mendham, which is right on the edge of uh, Fed Sun's territory. Basically, borders with the Capellans and the Torians. So it's quite a, like a disputed zone. Like it, historically, it was a Capellan system, and then it got taken over by the Fed Sons. Uh, in the future, which is beyond where I play Battletech, eventually it becomes a Taurian state. So it's yeah, it's quite a, a an interesting place because of all the like different cultures and, and powers operating on Mendham. And that makes a lot of sense to me because I've always I've always preferred the kind of peripheral. I won't say periphery, I'd say peripheral. That's kind of the edges of the inner sphere, um, bordering up to the um, like the periphery states. And I find that really interesting because you've got that kind of um, dynamic between a huge power like the Fed Sons at like the end of the Succession Wars are like the most are the biggest the the, the most successful um, Inner Sphere house or, well House Davian uh, probably not the richest I think that, that accolade still goes to the Free Wars League or um, the Lyran Commonwealth but either way they, they're, they're very powerful they've got a very excuse me like uh, solid military they've got um, you know like good science levels for the time they're the ones that kind of come up and instigate Project Phoenix with uh, the Lyran Commonwealth, so they start to kind of make new mechs at that time, and as do the Capones. Um, at this, uh, uh, actually, the Capones do a better job. Uh, you get things like the Raven and the Cataract. Um, you get some good stuff. You got some really good things out of Project Phoenix, actually, like the Hatchet Man. But the point is that if you find out what geography you are interested in, so do some like research on it. If you're watching this video, you will probably know. A lot about Battletech so you you if you are thinking about that mercenary unit then just I mean don't just get like a pen and put it on a map and say oh we're from this world like have some thought about it what do you like for me like that peripheral zone where it can get a little bit Mad Maxi but and you've got like those like uh, extra uh, like agents agents involved like the Taurians like the Canopians because they're quite close by uh, if you just want to kind of be completely uh like conservative with it then just play on like the capital homeworld of a major power you know you might love the um the draconis combine and decide you just want to set your guys up on luthien great uh, which is obviously the, the capital world of the draconis combine so do you in terms of where you want to set it that will have a huge bearing on kind of the identity of the um of the mercenary unit for instance if you are a like Draconis Combine, you're presumably going to have like really quite different like honor codes to others. Whereas my guys are all like, well, not all of them, but the two founders of Fed Sons and the Fed Sons are kind of like as close to like modern Westerners, I think, as you can get. How Steiner kind of tick that box as well. So they'll, be, I can identify with them as someone who's like writing for them because the the two like lead protagonists are of a similar like background and identity to me if you want to put it weirdly like that, even though they exist like a thousand years in the future. So I feel comfortable writing for them. Would I necessarily feel comfortable for writing for a Korean who's from like a Japanese lineage? Well, it's a little bit out of my experience range because I'm not Japanese. However, saying that, Battletech is such a wonderfully diverse universe. You might say, okay, like you might go Rasselhag, right? And then you've got like that Western European imprint within the Draconis Combine. So there's a million different things you can do. Just have a think about it. Where, and I tell you now, where you start or where you start the journey in terms of what you want to do with your mercenary unit will dictate terms really going forward. So think carefully about that. Don't jump into anything. You can do the law reading. Get on Sama. Read articles. Read these old classic books. Read the um, 
the fiction books as well, which is great. Things like you know the Warrior series or the Warrior trilogy. So uh, sorry, um, yeah. Always, yeah. You know, obviously, the more intel that you have, the, the better decisions that you'll make. So when you've kind of got those like um, primary facets set up of what we've just talked about, then you then can start to really flesh things out. And if you watch the previous video that I did, um, where I showed my like Excel sheet here. I kind of, it, it looked different um, in that I've had a bit of a, like a rummage around with all the forces. I've actually created like other um, tabs now. So I've kind of got like a hierarchical structure and like character development in there because I do intend on writing for the Dusk Haunters again. Um, purely like self-fulfilling to do that. And because uh, I love to do creative writing. So for me, like tying this in with that basically combines my two best like my two favorite hobbies so that's again the point of this it's like don't restrict yourself just to like one thing like if you there are several things that you enjoy the beautiful thing about the hobby is that you can just be as as varied and get as like dynamic as you wish to do as you wish to be so how i kind of structure it though is i, I kind of take my mercenary unit on a journey through that time period so and it can, and each time period reflects things like the mechs that we've got access to, uh, the geopolitical situation that we're in, um, whether they are kind of in a good place or a bad place. Like so, as a, for instance, I'm not going to document everything here, but I'll give a couple of examples. So we start up um, the 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 mercenary unit are started by um, Lemuel Durant. I've actually taken out all the personal names now, and I've just put in kind of their rank. So you can see Lemuel actually um, pilots the catapult and when he kind of takes over the mercenary unit, he is he's not actually a lieutenant because he gets kicked out of the academy, but he basically eventually, quite early on in my narratives for him, he becomes uh, like the lance leader, ergo that's kind of like lieutenant rank in the military, so you can kind of give him that unofficial rank. If all the ranks in this are unofficial because they're a mercenary unit, they're not part of a wider military. So Fredson's a uh, lieutenant, I've then got like a specialist character uh, in the Lancelot. Um, then we've got the Wolverine, that's his cousin's um, mech. And then we've got a Lyran Commonwealth uh, in the Enforcer. And you can see there that the mechs are very much um, like pretty high. I mean, they're actually very high quality. That's a really, really nice Lance, actually. So they kind of get a good start in life to the Dust Counters, but they're very, very small. You know, it's only Kismet Lance. Um, that's how they start. There's no money behind them. They're not like the um, the Kelhounds where they inherit a fortune and then basically buy mercenary outfit. Uh, these guys are coming off the back of like a, a, a Capellan raid and decide that, like, long story short, I'm not going to go into details on the narrative stuff, but um, Lemuel's cousin has her factory destroyed, uh, which she's kind of managing. She's only like in her mid-20s. Parents died early. Uh, so, but she's got quite a lot of like business acumen. And they have very little option. It's what they knew. They, they learned how to pilot mechs. Both of them learned how to pilot uh, mechs when they were kids or youngsters because uh, they come from like a, like a militaristic uh, lineage. And they were like, well, we've got a couple of mechs so we can kind of try to do something. But at that point, it's like that's super dangerous, right? Because it's generally dangerous work anyway. And if they don't even have like a leopard and kind of my first like story arcs for them is how they just go from like you know, a couple of mechs. It's basically the catapult and the enforcer. Uh, Lemuel steals the enforcer from uh, the, the academy and then they manage to get hold of the catapult through basically subterfuge, subterfuge never say that word, uh, against the capellans because the catapult is very much in a capellan mech. So they're the two mechs that they stand out with and then I kind of branch from there and start to build the narrative around them. And for the first kind of, for want of a better term, the first three I don't want to, I don't want to say here it's not books it's not seasons but like the first kind of dramas of the Dusk Haunters uh, lead us up through to 3028 when eventually they're able to create their own company and that's the the first box here so this is Azalea Company and you can see I've kind of assigned what kind of uh, where the mech warriors come from all these characters I will flesh out some of them have got like distinct uh, characters that I wrote for them when I was like a teenager others I've kind of had to go and fill in the gaps others I'm going to change like I'm changing the lance as I go as well because obviously it's not just it's not just me like theorying this and saying oh well I can just do whatever I want I am within the confines of I've still got to match this up to the hobby 
it's everything you see here will be like painted and tabletop ready so this is the full like reinforced battalion so it's uh just under 50 mechs i think if you if you talk about like all mechs and vehicles and infantry and vtols i think it comes in maybe to like 55 16 total which is pretty big um so and that's that's only at the end though which i'll talk about separately because uh, it takes them a hell of a long time to get up to battalion level and that's part of the story right so eventually they leave the uh like mendham and they actually go to the saint ives they get contracted by saint ives as a, a mercenary outfit that just successfully fought the capellans they get contracted by the saint ives to kind of train some of their mech warriors so that's this um, this lance here. So this is a discus lance in Bandolera Company. At that time, though, they're not Bandolera Company. It's just like an additional lance that they get. And you can see that I've reflected it in like um, the mechs that I've got hold of. So through like the Kickstarter, and I've spent a small fortune on all these mechs actually, because this is just a this is just my mercenary unit. I've got a hell of a lot as well for like Innisfear forces, clans, uh, periphery. You've, if you've watched my previous videos, you've seen. I've got quite a few. I think we're, we're, I'm going to get well in excess of 350 like max now. Yeah, that that whole thing that I said last year about like time, space, and money, the space thing has suddenly exploded. But whatever. Anyway, uh, these mechs though, so it's a Cyclops, a Longbow, a Grasshopper, and a Cataract. These are all mechs that you kind of associate with the Capellans. Uh, well, maybe not the Longbow, but certainly the Cyclops, the Grasshopper, and the Cataract. And they effectively, like, um, in their, they break free of the Capellan uh, state. And that's kind of a, again, that's a mercenary unit within the kind of greater confines of that political uh, drama. And that's, the, again, I love I, the St. Ive thing. I find really, really great. It's like a really nice little story. So my guys then go there, right? So we go from... Fed Sun's territory, which I really like, spend a lot of time there developing and kind of, you know, they kind of mature a little bit. Like um, Sam in particular is quite like, uh, Sam is, is uh, Lemuel's cousin, Samantha. She's quite like immature and a bit of a party animal. And then she kind of, you know, her arc kind of gravitates more towards taking things more seriously and becoming a little bit more like business-like. Uh, Lemuel can be quite like nihilistic and he's kind of not really bothered about anything other than piloting mechs <laughs> uh, and he has to kind of go on that thing as well of like actually I need to I, I'm responsible for people here um, so they all kind of have their story arcs intertwined in that as individuals but then that kind of gravitates towards the the sandbox that is the wonderful universe of Battletech so again, it's like first stop St. Ives. I'm not, I'm not going to go through all this because that would be very boring for you because this is all very subjective to me as I write it. But what I'm trying to get across is that message of have your mercenary unit, have like a loose idea of where they want to go and at what times build the unit around them. And that will give you absolutely a really, really solid base for your like Battletech journey. You don't have to do battalion level. I wasn't going to do it. I was going to just keep it to a couple of companies, but just the way I am, like I've seen mechs that I wanted. Um, you'll see there um, that there is an Annihilator on the books. Um, I did get a very kind person to send me the new Wolf's Dragoon um, like box set, which is only available in Barnes and & Noble. And annoyingly enough, um, we can't get that in the UK. They won't deliver it here. So um, but as soon as I got that Annihilator, I was like, I must have it in my mercenary force. Like It can't go anywhere else. And because they're, they're difficult for us to get, obviously, I mean, it cost me, I think, around like $75 to kind of get it here. So that's for the product and the shipping, uh, which is what's... I think it costs $30 in the store. So it's like, you know, well over what I should be paying. But such is life. And it's the only one that I have to do that for. The rest you can get in the UK. Um, when I got that Annihilator, I had to go back in and like jiggle things around a little bit. And one thing that I decided to do, and this is kind of the last thing that I'll talk about in this and then I'll wrap it up. Um, I did actually create a, uh, a command lance that eventually gravitate to a star. Strange. I mean, the Dusk Haunters eventually get uh, taken over by someone from the Draconis Combine who actually quite admires like the clan military. So everything kind of goes towards the clans, which I really like that bit in it, because, especially because I find the clans quite like antagonist antagonistic and I don't particularly like them. It forces me to play them a little bit and to kind of understand them. 
so things like you know you'll see here that i've got like assigned a clan nova cap uh like uh mech well, well they're basically point commanders translates as mech uh, warriors and you know they've even got like bondsmen on the book so like uh, clan smoke jaguar bondsmen come and join them so that really kind of changes their identity when they get an entire battalion of clans uh, they also look out like the first real break for the dust counters and they almost go under like they almost get destroyed they actually in my kind of old structured narratives for them they almost get destroyed twice but they really look out in 30 35 um, they basically do some like lost tech hunting and find a night star highlander a black knight and an exterminator all of which in 3035 are still super like powerful like lost tech max and that changes the game a little bit for them and eventually they, that that lands like transfers to their command structure so you can see here that like whoever the uh the lieutenant colonel is i say lieutenant colonel dash colonel um it's kind of military structure is always different in different militaries so you know and i'm not talking about battle today, i'm talking about any military structure um the only colonel in the actual of straight colonel which is basically um used when you've got someone in charge of a battalion that's when all the battalions are actually formulated which comes into effect as of 3061 so when i go into the fedcom civil war with the dust counters they've got all three battalions before that though they've generally only got two companies prior to the clan invasion so that would be a lieutenant colonel which is the kind of rank below a colonel so that reflects it because they don't have the battalion uh, i'm a bit of a weird stickler for like hierarchical uh like rank so and I've, I've made some of that up obviously myself because technically you know like it's arguable like is it a captain or a major uh that's in charge of a company well i just call them a captain but technically it could be a major so yeah i've got my own kind of like spin on that as well but roughly speaking you can see there that like by that era by like uh 3061 they're a really quite competent battalion similar to something like the the waco rangers i mean they're a a regiment obviously so they've got three battalions we've just got the one but i've even kind of gone down into like granular level here so i've got things like there's like the the black star here uh which is a black operations star which they get after the the clan invasion and that come that's a, a black jack a black cobra uh sorry battle cobra cobra a raven a lotus 2c and a point of elementals so i've got like a narrative for why they exist and what happens to get that and that is a super cool, like, basically the, the Dust Counters all uh, run out in uh, purple and yellow. That's like their their, co their colours. Uh, but Black Star are like black with like purple and yellow trim. And the Command uh, are like white with purple and yellow trim. So they kind of, they look different. They stand out from the rest of the, uh, the battalion because it's kind of the reinforcement side of the battalion. And then finally then we've got Support. So I've got I had um, I've got two um, clan mechs left over. Basically, they're both second line mechs, both twenty tonners. I can't fit them into the forces without it getting a bit complex uh, for the clan forces. So I gave them a baboon and a piranha, both of which are pretty terrible mechs. But I thought they'd actually be great in the dust counters as um, like training mechs, or they can even do like fetch and carry because they've got arms. Now I do have a, a Shigosa and a Patron, both of which are loader mechs. But it's that like that's how much character I want to give them. I kind of want to give them that level of support. And then we've got there the Dusk Riders, who are kind of the militaristic wing of the Dusk Hunters, and that's uh, two Drillsons, two Saladins. Um, I've actually changed it to one badger trap transport because they don't need to. I had it as two originally, but they don't need to. Uh, and a warrior attack helicopter, and then four standard infantry uh, units. I just bought some really, really cool um, six millimeter infantry units off Etsy. All like individuals, and they'll be tiny. But I want the previous infantry that I had were the really, really bad like metal ones, the like official uh, battle tech ones, and they're kind of in those lines of three, and they just look so dated and terrible. So I went on Etsy and found some really like cool looking, like almost like mad maxi type you know we like they have like flags and big weird guns and cool body armor and that to me is like given that i'm kind of very stuck in my ways with battletech and i like that like 80s battletech aesthetic that works well for me uh, i've got quite a few of them coming um so i'm giving three to kind of the wider general forces that i'll be kind of collecting and i've given one of the like well it's basically a a company right it's four platoons there 
and it's going to be seven guys or girls on uh, each base. So that'll give me like four points of not points. That's something else. It'll give me like four platoons of infantry. Um, and I can't wait to do that because I really was disappointed in the when I bought the um, well it was the Ral that I don't know who makes them. I'm Ral Pal for sell them. But they just like they're on really thick bases, and you can't actually like mold. You can't get them off the bases because then they wouldn't be secure on the um, on the terrain. So you'd kind of I don't know. I mean, I tried to kind of make it look okay, and it just looked terrible. Uh, I didn't like it at all. So instead, I've just gone for these. Like they're, they're all like individual dudes on little like tiny round bases that I'll then glue onto a bigger round the base can even like have some of them like behind terrains i think a couple of them have got like flags so i can even like do decals for the um well in this case it'll be the, the dust counters uh like icon which is kind of the the snarling laughing winking wolf's head which is done completely like uh in homage and disrespect of the uh the wolf dragoons because the wolf dragoons have that like gnarling smiling dragon wolfy thingy um mine is similar but it's like the punk version of that which is it's purple and it's basically doing like a cheeky wink grin thing um i'm actually thinking about getting some artwork commission for that i've already had quite a bit of artwork commission for the dust counters last year uh, some of which you've seen uh it's on the channel if i've just done a recording of all the um the hairbrain schemes parity playthroughs that um like picture that you see on the front there is, is lemuel sam and uh, I think Bear's in that photo as well. Um, who's Cadian. And then you can just, I think, see the head of Jessica, who is the very young uh, Draconis Combine kid. Um, she basically inherits her grandfather's um, Lancelot. Uh, long, long story, obviously. But it's like, it's the one mech they have that's amazing. Uh, the catapult's amazing as well, obviously. But the it, it's like double heat sinks. It's an incredible, like, lost tech weapon. Um and I've kind of, when I was, it's the one thing that I wrote when I was a kid that I think really holds up. Like when I've kind of talked about the narrative and how they kind of find that girl and uh, kind of like help her out and have her join in. And she's only like a kid. She's literally like 15 when they find her. Um, but that kind of, it gives a lot of like color to the story because she is such an, like she's so alien to that culture because she's like Draconis Combine and she's being brought up by her crazy grandfather. Um who's like effectively like a war criminal so she's pretty damaged but uh yeah like when you that's obviously the granular level that i'm going into which i'm not going to go into mass detail on here but you can do that right and that's the fun thing that kind of now again collecting painting uh doing like force management like this writing stories for them they're my hobby oh tabletop as well that's obviously the other, that's how this all kind of manifests itself if i ever want to like run campaigns with them Tie all that together in a nice, neat bow. And the best way to do it, by far, in my opinion, is mercenary units. Um, if you you can do it with like a like a great inner sphere house or something like that. So you could say, well, I'm going to create a company from this particular regiment or whatever, and like sh tell that that would be equally as good. Like I said, the only restriction is on that that you're kind of confined in terms of like where they can go at certain periods. So, for instance, if you were like um, I don't know, like a Federated Sons um, 3040 company. You can't really go and work for the Draconis Combine. You know, like they're not going to, like you are the enemy at that point. So you kind of restrict yourself in that. Whereas a mercenary unit can just kind of flitter between forces and have as much fun as they want to have. Anyway, I think I'll end that here because um, just a little treatise there on, on why uh, mercenary units are cool and why they work v incredibly well in Battletech and I think that I'm hoping that, that I can really kind of delve into this and flesh them out I'm not going to kind of go into the tab here on the dust counter structure because it, it does go into a lot of granular detail on like how many cooks they have and things like that because I really kind of want to drill down into the logistics which this book is super helpful with because it kind of gives you like ideas about how much things cost and, and things like that um so you can do it you can you can literally you could li just get 12 mechs and do this right and just say okay i've got these 12 mechs and they reflect this and that's a mercenary unit and i'm going to paint them in whatever color my favorite color and then like i'm just going to use them you can be that simple with it or you can create the you know the wolf dragoons or the iridani light horse <laughs> by going to which I'm, i think i'm like very much in the happy medium of that which is this is like 50 something mechs for my force 
Um, I can also run it competitively. I have got some incredibly crunchy mechs uh, in this set because if someone ever comes to me and says, let's have a campaign, like best of three, uh, 7,000 points versus 7,000 points, 30, 31, go, choose your force. I could like fill my boots with this like team. Um, so yeah, like if you're interested in competitive play, do it for that as well. It, like things like I have, I don't, this probably is not allowed within the fluff, but I've got a Kodiak on the books. Um, the Kodiak is an absolute lunatic of a mech. Um, it has got, just off memory, it's got a UAC 20, which is devastating. It's got eight extended range M lasers and it's got two SRM6 streaks. And it's pretty fast. For 100 ton mechs, it's a, it's a 4 6 in terms of, uh, you know, 4 running 6, sorry, 4 walking 6 um, running. It's a monster. I mean, yeah, obviously the battle value is going to be crazy, but that mech looks beautiful. Uh, the new sculpt on that, which I've got, um, I actually, I put an order into Catalyst a few days ago. And I've kind of, I came to the conclusion that I won't be satisfied until I've got every single lance pack. I kind of, I wasn't that interested in the clan stuff, but I've gone back into the clans. Over the next couple of months, I'll do another like update on project management and hopefully by that time I'll be completely finished. But suffice to say, it has changed massively since the last like video that I did on this, which was maybe like three months ago. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more to paint now, as you can see. At one time, like all this was like purpled out and now there's so much like white in there because i've just got so much more to paint uh that's great obviously that basically will keep me happy right into the summer i think uh, that's my aim to finish the whole collection is by uh, april may june time depending on my schedule um that will get me very happy i think if i can come out of that and say that i've got like every inner sphere force i've got like all the major clans or what all the major clans i want got a lot of periphery powers and I've got a full battalion of the dust counters and I've done all that in effectively a year a bit longer maybe like 14 months I will be absolutely delighted with that anyway I'll leave that here so I um, hope this finds you all well and hope you all have a very nice weekend and I'll hopefully catch you again in the next video